If you have your Bible with you, I would encourage you to open it up to 1 Samuel chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4. And I will apologize as we look at our screen up here. On the screen or the PowerPoint that I prepared, the screen was black and the words were white. Now the screen is white and you got white words, it's going to be hard for you to see them. Uh, but that's only on a few of the, the slides. The others you'll be able to see. But I will tell you, on this slide is simply the title of our lesson. And that lesson is, When Israel Lost the Ark. When Israel Lost the Ark. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. What I want us to do is look at the events that are recorded in the scriptures in 1 Samuel chapters 4, 5, and 6. When Israel lost the ark to the Philistines. And then we're going to go back and we're going to notice three lessons that this event reminds us of. When we come to this part of the history of the nation of Israel, the ending of the judges and the beginning of their kings, their primary enemy were the Philistines. Samson had to deal with them. Eli had to deal with them. Samuel had to deal with them. Saul dealt with them. And, and finally, David kind of resolves the issue and, and frees them from any trouble that the Philistines are going to bring to them. But during this time, they lived in the same area and they were enslaving one another. In fact, the Philistines were often enslaving the Israelites. God used those people to judge Israel. And so when we come to 1 Samuel chapter 4, we find that the nations once again are preparing for battle against one another. And when you get to verse 2 of 1 Samuel chapter 4, you read these words. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel and when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. It's not often in the scriptures that we read about Israel going to battle and them losing individuals. There are times, certainly, when they do. But if you remember studying through the, the book of Joshua, and the conquest of Canaan. The only time that you read about them losing any soldiers is when they battled against Ai, and there was sin in the camp. But here you have a situation where Israel has wandered far away from God. Eli is the judge. He's an old man. His sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were sons of Belial. They they were so wicked that they made the worship of God something that the people of Israel had begun to hate. And so God allows the Philistines to defeat Israel in battle. But Israel doesn't want to give up. And so they begin to think, how can we gain an edge against the Philistines? How can we make sure that we are going to be victorious? And the idea that they come up with is we will go and we'll get the Ark of the Covenant and we will bring it out into battle and we will rally around it. It will ensure that God is with us and we will have a great victory over these heathen Philistines. And so that's what they do. They go and they get Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and they bring the Ark of the Covenant. Israel rallies around it. There is such a shout that the ground shakes. The Philistines are wondering, what is going on? And word spreads. They've got the Ark of the Covenant with them. He, that, that Ark represents the God that slew the Egyptians. What are we going to do? And all the Philistines can say to one another is, let's just fight the best we can. You, you, let's show ourselves to be men and, and we'll see what happens. And the battle takes place. And you read about it 
in chapter 4 and verse 10. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent, and there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. The Philistines defeated them. Israel thought, having the ark with us will mean God's with us. But it did not assure them of victory. 30,000 soldiers die. And then in verse 11, we're told, And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And so the Philistines not only conquered Israel, but they've captured the ark of the covenant, and they take it back to their, their territory. Word gets back to the cities of Israel, in particular to Eli. I mentioned he was an old man at this time. I, I believe the Bible says he was 98 years old. The Bible also says he was blind and that he was a heavy man. And when they told him about the death of his sons and that the Ark of the Covenant had been taken by the Philistines, he fell off his chair backwards and broke his neck. It was the end of his life. Terrible times for Israel being defeated by their enemy, and now they've lost the Ark of the Covenant. Well, when you get to chapter 5 of 1 Samuel, you see what the Philistines want to do. And this was something that was pretty common in those days. You see, they had the idea, many of these peoples did, that each land or each territory was ruled by certain gods. And whoever's god was the strongest gained victories and so their God must have been stronger than the God of Israel and so they bring back this trophy the Ark of the Covenant and they're going to put it in the temple of their God kind of to, to show what we've conquered and so they take the Ark of the Covenant and they go to Ashdod and, and they put the Ark of the Covenant in the temple of their God Dagon now we don't know a lot about Dagon. There are a couple of different thoughts. Some think that maybe it was a corn god. Others think that it was probably a fish god. There's a, a word dag that meant fish. And so they think that this god of the Philistines, and they're right on the Mediterranean, was probably a, some kind of a combination between a human and a fish. And so they had a statue of this Dagon there, and they put the Ark of the Covenant in, in that temple. But well, when you get to chapter 5 in verse 3, after they've put the Ark of the Covenant in that temple, here's what happens. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the Ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. Their God Dagon was on his belly before the Ark of the Covenant. Now, folks... I don't know about you. I hope that some of the Philistines got the message. But if you have a God that you have to pick up off the floor and stand back up, that, that's probably not much of a God to be serving. But that's exactly what they do. Now, I dropped my clicker. I've got to get back up here. But anyway, the next day, something even worse happens. Verse 4, And when they arose early on the morrow morning, Behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. In fact, because of this, the priest of Dagon would not even step on the threshold any longer because that's where his head and hands were cut off. But here, God demonstrates before the Philistines his superiority to their God or so-called God. Now, that wasn't the only thing that was going on. Not only was this idol falling over before the Ark of the Covenant, God was afflicting the people of Philistia. 
In 1 Samuel 5 and verse 6, we're told, But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emrods, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And you look at that and we wonder, I know, what, what kind of plague is being talked about here? Emrods. Well, we don't know exactly for sure. Many people suspect that it was some kind of tumors that were brought up on them. And we do know from the text that it was something that would affect them in evidently the groin area, in their hinder parts. And many think that because of what's mentioned a little later with the mice or the rats, that this would have been bubonic plague. Now, whether that was the case or not, I don't know. I know that it had a terrible effect upon them. When you think about bubonic plague in the 1300s, it hit Europe and Asia and northern Africa, and one-third of the world's population died. 75 million to 200 million is the estimate of deaths. And it happened as it went from place to place in a matter of weeks, days and weeks, as that hit. We know today that that plague was spread by the fleas that were upon the rats. And here you're going to see them with that kind of connection again as they send back things to the, the people of Israel. So that's why many suspect that it was something along those lines. If, if it was not that. But whatever it was, it was a terrible affliction, bringing death to them. And so the people of Ashdod say, we, we got to get rid of this ark. Hey, let's send it to another city in, of the Philistines. So they send it to Gath. Now, you remember Gath. Goliath was from Gath. And so when it gets there, the same thing happens. Their people are afflicted. And so they sent it to the next key city, Ekron. And in verse 10, we're told, Therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron. And it came to pass, as the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. And, and that's what keeps happening. And so the Philistines decide... We've got to send this thing back. And that's what you read about in chapter 6. And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. So they go to the priest of Dagon, and they go to the diviners, the people that are looking at the entrails of animals to try and read the future, to get an answer. And their answer is, you need to send it back, but you need to send a trespass offering. And here's the kind of trespass offering you need to send. We've got five key cities among the Philistines. You need to send back five golden emrods, these tumors, and five golden mice or rats. And you send the ark on a cart back to Israel. Now, they wanted to test to see if this plague that had been brought upon them was actually from the God of Israel. And so they set up a scenario which probably wouldn't work in most instances unless God was directing it. What they said is, you need to take two milk cows that just had calves, and you need to take those calves back home and you tie these milk cows that have never had a, a yoke on them, and you let them pull the cart. And if they pull it straight to Israel, about 17 miles, you know that the hand of God is in this. But if they turn around and come back to their calves, or if they won't pull the cart, then we'll know that it wasn't from God. Well, I don't know a great deal about cows. I, I asked an es expert this afternoon. I was talking to him about calves and cows and how difficult it is. I've heard people talk about, you know, taking that cow, calf away from the cow. How do you do it and what do the cows do? And 
the, those cows, those mama cows, they like to see their calves. And even when you separate them by a fence, they, they want to keep them, their eyes on them. There's a lot of lowing and mooing, and they want to get back together. But these cows that had never had a yoke on them, never pulled a cart, just pulled away from their calves, they make a beeline to Israel so that the Philistines knew that this was from God. Verse 9 says, And see if it goeth up by the way of his own coast to Beth Shemesh, that he hath done us, this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. And they quickly learned it wasn't a chance. God had brought that affliction upon them. When the cart makes it back to Israel, the people take the cattle, they take the ox coat, the, the cart, and they they offer them. They have a sacrifice there. They consume everything that was used to, to bring the ark back. But there was great, great rejoicing among the people of Israel. It's been gone for seven months, and now it's been brought back. And so this is the account that's given in these few chapters about when Israel lost the ark to the Philistines. But let's think for a few moments about some lessons for us to learn that can help us in living for God. The first one is this, and that is thanking God is with us and God being with us are two different things. Thanking God is with us and God being with us are two different things. Israel thought if we take the ark with us, it will ensure us a victory. God will be with us. He'll be on our side. But that was not the case. The ark wasn't a good luck charm. It wasn't something that was going to assure that God would be with them. God would be with them if they were righteous, and they weren't. But they thought God was with them. And there is a great difference between thinking God is with us and God actually being with us. Do you remember studying about Samson? In Judges chapter 16, you read about this man who was used to deliver Israel from the Philistines at an earlier day. He runs into Delilah. And it's not long until you read there in chapter 16 about Delilah being offered money to find out his secret so she could reveal it to the enemy. And so she begins to ask him. And he tells her story after story about what's the source of his strength. And three different times, she uses those things and then says, the Philistines are upon you. And he just gets up and fights them off like it's nothing. The fourth time, he finally tells her about the razor, never touching his head. Remember, he was a Nazarite, and he had already broken the first two parts of that Nazarite vow, and now he tells her about the razor. And while she's, he sleeps on her knees, she has a man come and shave his locks. And then she says, the Philistines are upon you. And the Bible says here that he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. I think that's an important passage for us to think about. Samson thought God was with him just like he was before. He didn't feel any different. He didn't realize, though, that God was no longer with him. What's that tell us about our feelings? I hope it helps us to understand that feelings can be wrong. I'm not saying feelings aren't real. We have real feelings, but those feelings can be wrong. His feeling, it wasn't any different than before, but he didn't know that God was not with him. You think of Saul of Tarsus. 
What did he think before he sees that great light on the road to Damascus? He thought, I am fighting for God. He thought God was with him. But he was the one that was kicking against the bricks. You think about people that Jesus mentions in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have I not, we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These are people, evidently, who believe, you know me. You're with me. And he says, I never knew you. Our feelings can be misguided. They can be wrong. And our world needs to understand that. How many times have you talked to religious people or heard someone say something like, I know that I'm right with the Lord because I feel it right here and nobody can tell me any different. People trust their feelings instead of what God's Word says. Now you might say, well, preacher, how can I know? If I can't trust what I feel, how can I know? The Bible gives us the answer. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. Hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. That's how you know if you know the Lord, if you're walking in His ways, if you're obedient to His will. Understand that thinking God is with us and God actually being with us are two different things. Here's the second thing I want you to think about, and that is that heathenism cannot stand before God. Can't stand before God, and the Philistines found that out. They thought, we've got a trophy. We'll put it in the house of our God. Dagon falls over bows down to the Ark of the Covenant. The next day, his head and his hands are broken off. Heathenism can't stand before, before God. You look at a nation like Egypt, and you consider the plagues that were brought upon them. Do you realize that every one of those plagues were purposed by God to be an affront against one of their so-called deities. Things that they worshipped. They worshipped the river. They worshipped the sun. They worshipped their cattle. They worshipped those things. And God brought plague after plague upon them to show them their gods can't stand before Him. Pharaoh had said, who is the Lord? He found out. That's true of the gods of the Romans and the Greeks. I, I don't know about you. I, I, I'm kind of interested at times to learn about some of that mythology and some of the so-called deities that they had. But you know, the more I learn about them, it's curious to me, they all seem to have fatal flaws. They did the same things that the people were doing. They were involved in the same kind of immorality that man was supposed to, was doing. These gods weren't gods at all. They could stand before God. And neither could any of the gods of the nations around Israel. It's so tragic to think that having Israel's experience with Jehovah that they gave themselves over to worship the gods of the nations around them. They can't stand before God at all. In Acts chapter 17, verses 22 and 23, Paul would have this to say in the city of Athens. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, 
to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Paul wanted them to know that there was no God that could stand before God, the God. He was on Mars Hill. Mars was supposed to be the God of war. It's amazing to me, ironic really, that here on a hill for the God of war, Paul preaches to them the king of peace. And you look around today, and you might think, well, we don't have the idols that they had. Well, you might need to look again. There's a lot of idolatry in our world and, and gods that men have created. But I think especially in our nation of how we have elevated ourselves. We've tried to remove God and elevate man to that position. When you look at secular humanism, we're going to take care of all these problems all by ourselves. And I don't watch Dr. Phil, but I know that he's got a catchphrase and he asks people, how's that working for you? And that's really what I want to ask the world. How's that working for you? Look at where we're at. Are things better? When we try to remove God, the ideas of man can't stand. Heathenism can't stand before God. There's one more thought I want to share with you, and that's simply this. With restoration, there is joy. Can you imagine the joy that filled the hearts of the people of Israel when the Ark of the Covenant was restored unto them? Been gone for seven months, and now it's come back. Now, you will read a little later about some mischief that they got into. I guess it's more than mischief. A number of them looked into the Ark of the Covenant and it cost them their lives. But you see at first the sacrifice and the rejoicing that takes place when there is restoration. And when we come to the New Testament and we think about the idea of restoration or someone coming to Christ in obedience, we're reminded of the joy that's involved in that. And I don't guess there's a better chapter to consider than Luke chapter 15. Three parables that are told there. A, a, a lost sheep and a lost coin and a lost boy. And you have those restorations. When the lost sheep is found, verse 7 of chapter 15 says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. When the coin is found, likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And when that prodigal son comes home, but the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. When there's restoration, there is great joy. And my friends, that's the way it needs to be here as well. I hope that we always foster an attitude that encourages people to respond to the gospel of Christ, encourages people to obey the gospel, that that's our prayer, that that is our, our goal. When we stand to sing an invitation song, we're wanting people to respond to that invitation. And when someone restores or comes to be restored to that right relationship with God, I hope we have the attitude of the angels of heaven that there is that rejoicing. I imagine that some of us have heard of places where instead of there being that kind of rejoicing, there is the little whispers. wonder what he did. You think we ought to forgive him? You think they're sincere? And all the things that go through people's minds. Folks, that's not the attitude that we need to be having. We want to foster an attitude where there can be that rejoicing. 
and the renewing of fellowship in Christ and where we can encourage each other in our Christian walk. There is joy when there is restoration. And so you look at the events here when Israel lost the ark. It's a fascinating account. Here they are thinking this will ensure victory and it brings greater defeat. And then you see the Philistines with the Ark of the Covenant and the lesson that they were to learn about the God of Israel. And of course, we're reminded that thinking that God is with us and God actually being with us, that, that's two different things. And that heathenism, the things of this world, they can't stand before God. And that where there is restoration, there needs to be joy. I hope the next time you think about these events, you'll remember these lessons and they'll encourage you as a child of God. And if you're here tonight and you've not yet obeyed the gospel, we want to encourage you to take that step. We want to be able to rejoice with you. And if you're one who has obeyed, you've put on Christ in, in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins already, but, but perhaps you've fallen away or have been overtaken in a fault, we would love to help you in your restoration, to pray with you and for you, knowing that if you have that penitent heart, if you confess your wrong, God will forgive. And He'll restore you to that right relationship with Him once more. And so, my friend, if you're subject in any way to the invitation of heaven, we want to encourage you to come as we stand and sing this good song.